Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. It's episode number 77. Isaac Hadid and I are going to talk about focusing issues and how to get super sharp photos every time. So stay tuned. But first, hopefully you're watching us live. We broadcast live on Facebook. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash understand photography at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Fridays. But then we put the recording on YouTube and also we put the recording as, an, as a podcast on iTunes. So you can either listen in the car, you can watch on YouTube, or you can watch us live on Facebook. We also have a Facebook group. So you would, ta you would type in facebook.com slash groups slash understand photography. If you have questions about photography, any kind of a photography, what kind of uh, lens do I buy? How do I get the flash to balance with the background? Anything, anything. You can ask questions in our Facebook group. Our four weeks to proficiency in photography is our signature class. We offer that as a hands-on class here in Naples, Florida, but we also offer it as an interactive online class. Now check our website for the schedule, understandphotography.com, but that is the class you need to take to get a solid foundation in photography. Now, when I was learning photog photography for some reason, Everybody was teaching you to oh, start an aperture priority or program mode or whatever, and they were teaching me composition, and I, which is important, I understand. But until I really understood exposure and how to shoot in the manual mode, I was struggling. I was so much struggling. So this class is, the first class is shoot in manual. So you're going to learn to shoot in manual. You're going to learn a lot about composition to make your pictures have more impact. You're going to learn a lot about lighting, including flash photography, how to balance that flash, how to make it look natural, how to, uh, how to even use natural light to the best ability. And then, of course, our last class, we call it the technical stuff because it's metering modes and drive modes and white balance and focus points and things like that. We also have some other online classes, software classes, Joe Fitzpatrick is the leading Lightroom expert in this area, and he is so good. I mean, he really lives up to our motto of we simplify the technical. So our software classes are all formatted that where you have like a very short video where we really show you step by step how to do something, and we're going slow. We're like circling here, click here, click here. Because do you ever watch any of those videos where they're like click, 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 and you don't even see what they're clicking on? We don't do that. <laughs> Anyway, getting, start with room, getting started with Lightroom, he's got a second class called Lightroom Catalogs, Collections, and Folders. So that, to me, is the hardest part of Lightroom. So this class really clears it up. We've got a Photoshop cram course to get you started in Photoshop, and we've got a Photoshop Elements cram course to get you started in Elements. I got two more things and then I'm done with my commercials, okay? I have one opening left for our ladies' photo retreat here in Naples, Florida. It's limited to just three ladies. And it's May 4th through 6th, and we just, we just cram all kinds of photography into one weekend. And the last thing I want to talk about is if you are here in Florida at all, even Southwest Florida, even better, but if you're in the area, there is a big convention coming up March 9th through the 11th. It's put on by the Florida Camera Club Council, which is the umbrella group to the, cam the local camera club, the Florida Camera Clubs. So they put a statewide convention on March 9th through the 11th in Fort Myers, Florida. Check out f3c.org. It's f no, number three, c.org. My guest today is Isaac Hadid from Southern Photo Technical Service, which is what? We are uh, Florida's only authorized service center for all major brands of photographic equipment. So my Sony, my Canon, my Nikon, my all Fuji. Yeah, we're the you last do it ones. All. There used to be seven authorized service centers. We're the last sole survivors. Wow. And of course, we're based in North Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, we also have an office in Delray Beach serving Palm Beach County residents uh, for pickup and drop off uh, location. And of course, we have your studio, Understand Photography, here in Naples as a drop off location for customers' convenience. And uh, we're looking at uh, maybe expanding to do the same in Orlando. Awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, today, now Isaac's been on the show before. If you've watched it before, we talked about camera care. So this time we're going to talk about focusing issues. 
Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes it's user error, right? Or maybe not even user error, it's user ignorance. There's a lot of factors. Okay. Uh, one of the most common questions I get from my customers is they come in and they're getting like a sensor cleaning service or something, and they ask me, they say, Isaac, you know, can you check the focus on my camera? It seems like my, my pictures just aren't as sharp as they used to be. That is very, very common. Okay. And there are multiple reasons for that. The most uh, important reason for that to occur with digital SLRs is the normal wear and tear and usage of the camera. Okay. If you're a professional photographer and you shoot weddings and you're doing 3,000 frames a wedding or 6,000 frames a wedding as some do, uh, sports photographers, you know, shooting uh, football games, uh, wildlife photographers, they do a very uh, high volume of uh, still shots. Okay. And on all the digital SLRs, they have a 45 degree reflex mirror. Okay? okay, and that reflex mirror has to raise up and come back down uh, with each shot. Uh-huh. Okay, now if you do 3,000 shots a wedding, that's 3,000 times that mirror slapping up and down, slapping up and down, anywhere from seven to ten frames per second. Okay, okay. Also, when you have long, heavy lenses attached to the camera, okay, the weight of the lenses always pulling on the front of the camera will okay. start to distort the mount a little bit. Ah. Uh, other things is when you have a long lens attached to your camera and you bump the front end of it to the left or to the right, uh, one pound of uh, force on the, on the front end of the lens will cause about 10 pounds of force at the mount where it meets the camera. Oh my goodness, yeah. I am banging my lenses all <laughs> over the place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and of course, a lot of people will leave a lens attached and they shove it in their bag and, you know, maybe it doesn't fit properly and we'll put a little stress oh on it. Oh my God, I do that too. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of little things. You know, the, the, you know, when you're walking around with your camera bag and you're setting it down, how hard you set it down, how the equipment is positioned in there, if it has a lens attached, that all puts a lot of stress on the front body of the assembly uh, of the camera where the lens attaches. Okay. So, uh, I can use the analogy of like an automobile. Uh When you have a lot of wear and tear on your camera, what will tend to happen is the focus will drift out because the 45 degree mirror will come out of alignment, okay? And that pulling and stretching on the front body will also distort the accuracy of the focus. Ah. And so it's kind of like tuning up a car. The more you drive it, the more wear and tear you have on it. You're going to have to change the tires and you know maintenance it and service your vehicle more often than one that's uh, rarely used. Ah. So what do you do? It is common for our customers when they come in for professional sensor cleaning once or twice a year on average uh, that we check the autofocus accuracy of their cameras. And okay. then we can tell them, hey, you know, this is, you know, we're finding this, it's out of tolerance, and we give them the option to have it corrected. Is there a way that they can check it from home? There is, uh, but they're not very accurate. Oh. Uh, on the internet, you can find these focus charts, there's 45 I've seen those. degree charts. Uh, the Canon 45 degree focus chart uh, that uh, we have as a, an official test chart is actually four feet in length. So when they try to duplicate that on an 8 by 10 sheet of paper, the little blocks and the numbers are not referenced properly to use uh, in a correct manner. So okay. uh, it's not the best way. The best way is to have us uh, test it with uh, the factory uh, tools and test equipment and charts. Okay. And it's a free evaluation. Okay, so if it's, you think you're, I think my camera's starting to slip or whatever. So how often should I have it checked? At if least I'm once a, a year. Okay. And of course, if you've dropped your camera, even though you pick it up and everything seems to be working, chances are you have that trauma has caused uh, damage to the autofocus accuracy. Can you fix a lens if the lens actually gets a little, I don't know if bent is the right word, bent but I loose. remember I had an old lens and it was a cheap lens, so I didn't bother to do anything with it, but it started getting tight to zoom. And I think I knocked it too hard and that, it got- That's a symptom of impact can you, damage. Can you fix that kind of, of stuff? Course, of course. Really? Yes. Everything can be fixed. Oh, I didn't so know that. So let's talk about zoom lenses. Okay. Uh, when we uh, zoom our lenses from wide to telly, wide to telly, sometimes we do it with a lot of force. Okay. There are rollers and bushings that help maintain the glass to move in and out while zooming. The bushings are made like little plastic rollers. Okay. If you drop your lens, uh, those little plastic bushings can crack and break. 
Okay, so, oh. and then secondly, the little channels that they drive through, uh, if you can imagine a, a swirling river that bends to the left and bends to the right, uh, if you have a zoom lens that's tight, or, you know, like it's moving smooth and gets tight at one point, uh, that means that those little river channels are crushed, and that roller and, and bushing cannot get through that channel properly, and it gets too tight. And then once you force it through those hard spots, then the screws will completely break out of the barrel and become loose, okay? Ah. So those would all require service and repair. Now, what about normal uh, wear and tear of the zoom lens? Just the normal wear and tear over 10, 15 years in some cases, or seven years of heavy use, as little as five years with extensive use, uh, those roller bushings will wear out. And then you start to get loose zooming barrels. Okay. You extend the zoom all the way out and you feel a lot of looseness in the front. Okay, that means the glass is not gonna stay optically aligned properly. Okay, so even if it feels smooth, zoom it out and feel the end of the barrel and see if the front end of the lens is wobbling. If it's wobbling, uh, the rollers are broken or worn out and that requires repair. And you can replace those yes. rollers. Because oh, I know, I've, I, I, you heard me telling this story earlier today that I bought my, my most used lens, my 24 to 70 f2.8 lens mm -hmm. in 2001. Right. And that is still my most used lens, and I am busy. I don't do 3,000 pictures in one wedding, holy crap, but I do probably 3,000 pictures a week. So, wow, it That's gets a, lot, a of lot of wear and tear. And let me remind you, Peggy, back in the film camera days, a traditional wedding photographer would take 300 frames. I was there. Okay. <laughs> That's when you said 3,000, I was like, right. I, I take about maybe... I probably take a thousand and give the customer seven hundred because if you don't give them seven hundred now, they they think you just were goofing off all day or something. A true professional <laughs> photographer doesn't need three thousand frames. I can't even but, imagine when you said that. I was like, whoa. <laughs> exactly. But you know, with today's technology, you People got a rechargeable do. battery, you got a reusable memory card. It really doesn't cost you anything to shoot three thousand frames six thousand frames other than the maintenance of the wear and tear on your equipment over time and the time to go through all those pictures absolutely that's absolutely that's the main reason i wouldn't want to do it but also also like my son's wedding you know the pictures were very nice and everything but they were like here's 25 pictures of the same exact thing why do we need so many of the same thing i don't know some photographers <laughs> think that they need to capture every fraction of a second you know so yeah so okay so, okay, so... Um, so those can be repaired too. All right. As an authorized service center, we have all the tools and test equipment and factory trained technicians. Uh, we provide free repair estimates. So anytime any of our customers are in doubt, mm -hmm. they can bring it in or mail it into our facility and for a free evaluation. We'll let the doctor see the patient and we'll determine uh, if anything is wrong and what it's going to cost to correct it. Okay. Now, what... It, uh, I'm just trying to remember, I should have had this question written down, but it's coming into me right now because I remember, I think it was you who told me that they didn't, you didn't used to have to calibrate the lens to the body, but now you do? That is correct. Almost all of the uh, digital SLRs on a professional and a medium grade level, uh, they have what's in the menu called AF fine tuning. Now, AF fine tuning uh, is used when, uh, let's say a camera is working perfectly, Okay. But the focus motor inside the lens uh, is starting to fail. If uh, for you know our viewers that uh, know about motor torque, the camera, the way autofocus works, the camera determines move the lens this way, move the lens that way, and now please stop. When it sends the signal to stop, if a motor is too tight, uh -huh. it will stop a little too premature than the camera anticipated. Uh -huh. If the motor is worn out and is too loose, it can tend to overrun and then go a little further than the camera anticipated. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean the lens needs repair. So the companies like Canon and Nikon, they have put that option in there to allow customers to avoid a costly repair and allow uh, up to 20 micrometers of fine-tuning a lens to a camera. Okay. That will buy the customer and the user and the photographer a little bit of time before they actually have to have the lens serviced. So I could do that myself? You can. How do you do it? 
Uh, it's in the owner's manual. They'll explain how to Is do it. Is it in the menu of the... Yes, it's a menu option uh, in the setup menu. And it's called AF... Fine Tune. AF Fine Tuning. That's correct. So you look through the menu. Yes. You find that. Then you look in your manual. And, and you figure out what to, to do it. <laughs> with it. <laughs> so as an example, let's say, <sighs> let's say you're focusing on my eye. And the true focus point is back here at the ear, okay? The sharpest point of the final uh, picture. Even though my focus point is right on right your on, eye. right on my eye. But it's focusing right. over on your this ear. This is what we refer to as back focus, okay. okay? Because the true focus point is behind the subject. We call that back focus, okay? okay? In that case, in the fine, AF Fine Tune, it'll show you a little image of the camera and your subject, and there's a, a scale, and you can actually move the focus point closer to the camera. Oh. And then you can take some more test shots until you can get it precise. I see. But it's limited to what we call 20 micrometers, which is not a lot. It's not significant, but it is helpful uh, with some lenses. All right, so let me get my mind around this. So I have, I've got... And I've got an older Canon 6DD, mm -hmm. and I've got a Canon 6D, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if my 24 to 70 is calibrated for the 60D, does that mean it's... Wait a minute, that's not my question. My I question is, I My question is different <laughs> lenses. Okay, so if I have... I use on my 60D the six, 24 to 70 sometimes, the 70 to 300 sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Is it going to be? I understand, and let me explain it so the viewers. Yeah, because I can't can seem to get it, it out right. <laughs> let me explain. You can take two perfectly working cameras. Okay. And you, let's say a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens is put on one, uh -huh. and it requires a little bit of AF fine tuning. Let's say it's uh, back focusing by five micrometers. Okay. When you do that fine tuning, the camera will record what lens that is by the serial number. It'll know the 50 millimeter, 1.4, and it registers it by the serial number. So anytime you add that lens to that camera that's been custom calibrated to that camera, the camera will recognize it and it will automatically adjust to the preferences that you set up in the AF Fine Tune. Wow, that's pretty impressive. So then you go to your next camera model, put the same lens on another perfectly working camera, you may find that it requires no AF Fine Tuning, or maybe it's front focusing by three or seven micrometers. So then you can fine tune that lens to that camera separately. And again, the second camera will record it by its make and its aperture, you know, 50 millimeter, 1.4, and the serial number. So each camera will have its own recording that no matter which camera you put the same lens on, it will act differently to focus correctly for the photographer. Wow, that is, so they really are little computers, aren't they? Oh my Auto God. Autofocus is very, very uh, sensitive. And it is so sensitive that these are the steps that the manufacturers had to make uh, to get the best photo quality possible. Now, is that part of your, when you do the check, is that what you do, this AF fine tuning? To? Well, we do that for our clients. Okay. Uh, we have had many clients that went through, they got five, six, seven lenses, and they try to do it with the charts, and they come in with their whole camera bag full of stuff, and they say, Isaac, you know, I tried to uh, AF fine tune my lenses. It, I, I think I made it worse than when they were. And I open up the camera and I turn it on. I look in the menu and yeah, they have like, you know, six or nine <laughs> lenses that they attempted to fine tune. The first thing I do is I shut off the auto fine tune. I put our test lens on the camera, use our test charts, and we check to see does the camera body with our test lens and the Canon charts or Nikon charts, does that camera focus accurately first? Oh, okay. okay. Make so sure it's a, not the camera. Correct. We want to get the camera correct first. Okay. Then we will go and try each of their lenses, lenses individually, okay, to see how they respond to the perfectly working camera. Okay. In the cases that we need to AF fine tune a, a lens to uh, the customer's camera, we charge thirty-five dollars a lens. To do but that. But we have the right tools and test equipment. It only takes about five to ten minutes a lens when we do it. I've heard stories of people spending up to half an hour trying to do it themselves per lens. So if you have five lenses, you know, that's a whole afternoon that you spend trying to fine tune it and it's not always successful. Okay. Complicated. So you just made me think of something else too because you were here today cleaning sensors and all kinds of stuff and there was a lady here at the end that you were talking to and she said, oh, I'm having some focus issues I forgot to tell you. 
And uh, okay, so your question, and this is the question people, because you know we ship stuff to you, so this is something we ask people all the time. I'm having focus issues with this camera. Did you try another lens? That's the first step, right? Absolutely. What else, what are they supposed to do before they, to make sure that it's not, you know, to figure out what to send you, I guess. In the reference that you made to the young lady this morning, she had a, a, a camera with two lenses uh -huh. and her kit lens, it was a Canon 18 to 55 uh, with image stabilization. Uh, she said she was having trouble with that one focusing. Sometimes it would, sometimes it would not. And she also had a Tamron lens uh, that she didn't feel uh, had anything wrong, but asked me to check it out. So what I found in her particular case is that her camera was working fine. Her Tamron lens was working fine, but the focus motor inside her 18 to 55 millimeter lens had died. Uh -huh. It wouldn't even respond to the focus request of the camera. It wouldn't move in and out. It wouldn't hunt. It wouldn't budge at all. Uh, so uh, she required a focus motor replacement. And uh, so we took it in for repair. And Is we're that gonna... worth it on an 18 to 55? Sure, sure. Okay, because that's uh, not a very expensive lens, right? No, but the new one now, the, uh, if you go to B&H Photo or Hunts Photo, wherever you uh, go to buy your photo equipment, uh, you'll find that that lens is about 249 new, and they're only like $109 uh, to refurbish it. Wow, I didn't know they were, because I think I yeah, bought one for 100 bucks when I bought mine, because you know why I bought <laughs> one? I, I have a very different story than the rest of the world, because I started... In, I got into photography because I got a part-time job at a photography studio and I started getting interested. So my first lens was a $2,500 lens. <laughs> so when I started teaching, everybody came in with these 18 to 55 millimeter lenses and I'm like, you know, oh, shallow depth of field. Well, they couldn't do the couldn't shallow do depth of field. Right. And so I bought one of those lenses so that I could relate to my students. Right. And it is a whole different world. <clears throat> but it was like 100 bucks. This is it's in like 2009. Point. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, we have people that come in all the time and they're just getting into photography or they're just trying to get a photography business started. And they started with, a, you know, an entry level digital SLR package, you know, which traditionally comes with an 18 to 55 uh, kit lens that has an aperture of 3.5 to 5.6. And then they get a, a 55 to 200 that also has a. Uh, 4.5 to 5.6, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maximum aperture. And they say, hey, how come I can't get the same results that I see other photographers? And that depth of field control to be able to shoot a zoom lens at a maximum aperture of 2.8 and reduce that depth of field is what gives impact to the photo. You know, yeah. you can blur out the background, your face, you know, your, you know, your eyes go right to the subject. You're not seeing garbage cans or people mm -hmm. up in the stands of a stadium uh, in the background. So they don't really understand what photography is about. These are people that are just learning and they have a lot to learn. Yeah. And they will find out eventually it's not the camera that makes the photo good. It's the photographer and the glass, yep. you know, what we call the lenses. The lens. Okay, it's all, all right, but lenses. I'm going to go back to my question because you think you answered it, but you didn't. <laughs> there was a step two. My to, question there was. There was a step two to her, question, to her problem. Okay, go ahead. The other problem is uh, she was using the AF area mode. You know, the digital SLRs now have multiple focus points. I think uh, Nikon has many with like 51 focus points and Canon has a gazillion focus points. And it depends. Some of them, like the more sophisticated, like the, what, what are the sophisticated, 7D Mark II Canon yeah, or something? Yes, and the 1Ds and, and the 5Ds. Well, they're like specifically for sports photographers and you're right, they've got zones and yes, all yes, kinds yes. of stuff. Many different. Very, very sophisticated focusing yes. systems. And the most popular. And complicated. Yes, and the most popular is the auto area where all the autofocus sensors are on. Well, that's the default. Correct. So you, 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 you pick up your camera, you put it up to your face, you focus, uh, you know, you hit the focus button, the shutter release, and now the camera is looking at what it sees, and it might see an object at five feet, it might see an object at six feet. There might be something in the background at infinity or 30, 40 feet, mm -hmm. okay? There might be something over the left at seven feet. And the camera's sensors will detect what items can I see contrast and lock onto. So they're so, looking. So the sensor's looking for contrast. Right, and, it's and looking, when you say and it's contrast, that means like a sharp edge or a black and white edge Correct. or something like Even, that. Even you know the lips, the eyes, you mm -hmm. know wrinkles in the face. It cannot mm -hmm. see. No digital SLR can see a solid color. Right. So if Whether you try to black, focus white, on like gray, a white, white background, it won't color. focus. It won't autofocus. It will not autofocus. It'll manually focus. 
You can manually focus. Yeah. It won't, it won't <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so in that case, if, you, if you're looking through the viewfinder and you activate the autofocus and you see five of those little lights come up of the focus sensors in the viewfinder, it's saying these are the things we locked onto. Now, you as a photographer have to say to yourself, well, did it lock onto what I wanted? Is that my subject? Or is it looking at things in the background or over on the left side that are not at the same distance to the camera as my subject is? So that is the, what I call an amateur mode. Okay? Oh. It should never be used by a professional okay. or any serious photographer because you really can't confirm which of those focus points it's going to lock onto to make sure it's actually your subject. And I have a story I have to tell you because okay. I had, a st okay, all, all the local students, I always say, well, if I have a family portrait or something, if you want to come with me, I won't pay you, but you can come with me, just stay close to me, I'll tell you what I'm doing, this kind of stuff. So this one gal said, I really would like to come with you on these corporate shoots that you do. Not event photography, because I can't bring people, but like I had a picture of 100 people I had to take. They were here on convention, they want to picture the whole group. So, you know, that takes a lot of planning, risers and all this kind of stuff. So I got it all set up. I had a big ladder because we had a shoot from a vibe. I had studio lights, everything. I'm setting everything up. I have everything set up exactly how I want it. I have one focus point chosen, and it's right in the middle. There you go. Okay? So I told her, get up on the ladder, because I'm going to go yell at these 100 people because I'm going to try to arrange them because they can't hear me from way back there. All I want you to do is hit the button when I tell you. She changed my, f she thought that when you had auto focus points, that me meant that all of the focus points were activated. <laughs> so she changed my focus points to automatic. Oh, jeez. And all of them, almost all, thank God not all of them, but most of them focused on the far left for some reason. They probably so the people saw more on contrast the far there right, and determined that was the subject. People on the far right were soft and I had to end up photoshopping like I'd had to cut the picture in half and photoshop this half with that half because she screwed my pictures up all she was supposed to do was press the button <laughs> and there is an algorithm uh, involved in the computer chips of the camera so when it sees five or six different things at different distances it has to do an average it will make its own average and determine I think this is the best point of focus to start with to give the best result. That's why I say this is an amateur type of uh, technology. Yeah, you don't depend on your camera. So anyway, just I want to just put that into their minds. When you see all of those auto focus points lit up, that means auto. That doesn't mean they're all going to be focusing. No, no. The camera. Because <laughs> that's what she thought. No, the, the camera is going to move the lens in and out. It's going to make a specific target between a measured mechanical target you know, uh, measured in inches or meters, whatever you want, from the lens to the subject, period. It's okay. actually from the sensor to the subject, okay. you know, okay. inside the camera, okay? So it's going to make an average, and that's not always what you want. No. I'll give you an example. A customer came in the other day. He was doing paparazzi stuff. He likes to walk around the streets and take pictures of people down the streets. So he shows me a, a photo. He's on one side of the street. Uh, at a 45 degree angle to a woman walking with a bicycle on the other sidewalk okay. and he was about 40 to 50 feet away from her now she's on walking her bicycle she's got a building behind her 40 feet behind her he was using the auto area and apparently when he took the photo the building looked better than his subject because the building in the background represented about 60 percent of the entire photograph she was only a smaller percentage, and it found too many targets on the building behind her. It determined on its own that it was the building that was the subject, not the woman walking the bicycle. Yeah. So she was a little softer in focus than the wall behind her. Yeah, that's... So that's a tragic mistake. That is so common. And you just made me think of another <laughs> user error on focusing, <laughs> is the focus mode yes. that they're in. Yes. Uh, continuous focus mode is uh, very, very tricky. Uh, for uh, as many photographers as I try to beg to use, to use the single focus, which means the camera will not take a photo until it confirms focus is on the subject, then it allows the shutter release to take place. Okay. Okay, that's the safest. And that's, it's called AFS on a Nikon and Correct. Sony, and Correct. it's called, is uh, it called single shot or one shot? Single shot, shot on a Canon as one well. One shot. 
One, one shot. shot. One shot. Single shot. Single shot. Single shot. <laughs> there you go. I'm a cannon okay, shooter. Shot. I should know that. <laughs> now, when do we use continuous focus? We use continuous focus when we're trying to photograph a moving subject. The most common is someone or uh, like a football player running towards you or running away from you, an auto race car going left to right or an birds. Auto, or person and birds. You know, down here it's birds. Correct. <laughs> so in the continuous focus mode. The camera will automatically determine the speed of the subject and it starts tracking it and it starts to predetermine where it's going to be next. Okay. Okay. That's a great feature. It is and a great it works feature really for good that type of for stuff. For that type of photography. This the bad part is is the camera will allow you to go ahead and snap the picture whether it's the subject's in focus or not. Hey. Yes. So it's it's kind of an art. Okay, it's kind of an art to be monitoring in the viewfinder. You're going to keep your AF on to activate the focus and keep it running with the AF on button on the back of the camera. That way it keeps predicting and predicting and then you use the shutter release to capture at the moment you want. Okay. So the AF on button on the back of the camera is very important. You use your thumb, you activate the focus and it's now tracking your subject, tracking your subject. Then fire, fire, fire with your index finger when ready and hope that you had it right. Okay, there now that's no called AFC on a Nikon Correct. and Sony, and it's called AI Servo. On Canon. On a can and AI stands for Artificial Intelligence. There you go. It's not AL Servo, it's AI Servo. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very we good. We always go like, you know, it's like when people say AL Servo, you're like, ah! <laughs> anyway. And, and even okay. in the best case re uh, scenarios, uh, we have a professional photographer. Uh, all she does is shoot uh, horse racing and things like that. So she's got high end professional Canon equipment, okay? And she's at the side of the track, and now we have a horse galloping with a racer. The horse is going up and down. The racer is going up and down. They're moving left to right in the viewfinder. And she's tracking that moving subject. If you're using a single point that's too small, you're going to have a problem. Because if you land it on the belly of the, of the horse, he might be all brown. There's that solid color problem. Ah. So, right? So then you can actually expand that to like a nine point nestle in the middle of the photo. You can, or you like can move an, it around. So now this is called a focus area. Focus area that you control. You can open it up to nine or 15 and points. And it's not just in the middle. It just expands it. It's it not just a single It could be in the middle, point. but it could also be. You can move it to the left, the right, up and down. In case you want to get the head of the horse or Correct. something. Correct. You okay. got to remember that all these camera models have a different amount of focus points. Right. And the, the more uh, professional it is, the more more options you have available. Yeah. In the amateur entry level, you you have very few choices. Right. And that's a little more difficult. And and like for a wedding photographer, you don't need all those focus points. No, you, you know? Don't. You don't. Or a portrait photographer. Not at we all. don't need that those kind of sophistications. So Correct. all right, let's talk about the third focus mode, which is AI focus on a Canon or AFA. Autofocus automatic on a Nikon. That's that area focus. That's that all area. No, that's the mode. The no, mode. AFA on the Nikon you know is what that, AF area. Oh, I thought it was auto. Because well, that's auto. the one that switches between it, it, the AI. The name is auto, AF auto. Oh. But that's the whole area. That's using all the sensors. If you look on the LCD, it will show you a representation of the frame. And it's got a whole big square box, meaning it's going to try to look at everything using all the sensors. Okay, so those are the ones we don't want to use. With the Canon, well, this is the default now, though. It this is the is, default out of this. This is why people are having so much trouble focusing, in my opinion, because the default used to be one shot or AFS. Now the default is the AI focus, is what Canon calls it, and it switches between AFC and one shot. So I somehow automa I ac accidentally knocked mine into AI focus. I have no idea why, because I <laughs> never, ever, I hate that mode. I think it's the worst focus mode to be in. But I was trying to focus, recompose. And when I say focus, re I focus on somebody. I hold the button down, the shutter button down, to, to lock the focus, and I slightly move and take the picture. Well, it wasn't working for me. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I looked and I was in AI focus. I'm like, how did I get in that? But whatever. But all these poor new people, that's the mode that they get. Why are they doing that? I'm going to make my own assumption with my 38 years experience. Okay. The reason why they do that is they want 
this camera to have its best ability to autofocus right out of the box. So for an amateur that doesn't know how to use individual focus points and use all these individual, it just wants to throw all the AF sensors uh, out there. Please lock on to something and get this guy a photo. Okay. <laughs> I bet you're right. I bet you're right. Because right. that is, it was, when I started teaching in 2009, people were not having the same trouble focusing as they are now. And I'm like, how how could that be? Because the computer, the cameras are so much more sophisticated, but it's that damn I swore on my own show. <laughs> <laughs> it's that that AI focus or AFA focus mode. I, I'm going to take it another step. Up. These cameras, they want them to work just average out of the box. Just it's going to work. It's going to take a picture. It'll find something to focus on, you know, unless it's really, really bad subject matter or so. But it goes beyond that, Peggy. If you look at all the different features and functions available in the menu systems, the problem for photographers that are just learning, they need to take lessons. These cameras have so much technology built in it, and if you don't utilize and understand the technology built into these cameras, you cannot use the power that the camera has available to the, to the photographer. And let me give you some examples. I know very few, I would say less than 10, professional photographers in my Miami area that truly know how to set up their camera at a photo shoot, take all their photos, go home, and to practically do zero post-editing. Now you're going to lose all your customers. <laughs> okay, it's easy to just put up the camera, take a picture, now you go back, you put it in Lightroom, you lighten it, you darken it, you start increasing contrast, you're doing sharpening, you start adjusting the colors, okay? Very few people can go to a location, okay? And instead of using the auto white balance, they're gonna do a custom white balance to really get the colors right, okay? Then they're gonna set up their contrast. They're gonna set up what type of file do they want? Do they wanna shoot it in a fine JPEG or do they wanna shoot it raw? Okay, or do they want to shoot it on basic because they're not going to do a lot of editing? Are they going to have the right lenses to compose the picture properly and not have to crop and restretch it uh, after the fact? Okay, and even the color controls, you can adjust the colors in the camera beyond the color temperature settings of white balance. Mm -hmm. Very few people really know how to use their cameras and the power built into these cameras that they can go and do a photo shoot and come back and say, Here's 300 photos, none of them need editing. Or maybe some little tweaking of cropping here right. and there. Well, you know. Less it, than 10. And I, let me put my little commercial, four weeks to proficiency in photography. We teach all the basics, almost everything you just talked about, include, and we also talk about focus modes, <laughs> how to change your focus mode, why to change your focus mode, focus points, things like that. But it is a very... It's the foundational stuff, and for some reason, a lot of the teachers don't even teach the foundational stuff, and I, I have a hard time understanding that. Depends on the teachers. Yeah. You know, so. there, there, there are good teachers, there's bad teachers. Uh, that can happen both in uh, college level uh, photography and even uh, from photo studio and professionals uh, alike. Yeah. Okay. I know a lot of professionals like yourself that also you know, teach people. Uh, they have entry level, you know, four or five levels and Photoshop and Lightroom. And uh, only the good ones, they have the repeat customers that come back and say, hey, I finished level one, I loved it, now teach me the second level, teach me the third level, and really build on it. And that's a testament to teachers like yourself where people can say, hey, I really learned a lot and I want to keep expanding on what I've learned. And I want to get to where I need to yeah. be because I'm not there yet. Anything else you want to talk about focusing? Yes. Let's go back to that single uh, focus point. Okay. Uh, why do we want to use that? Because sometimes we're taking a horizontal photo, sometimes we're taking a vertical photo. Okay. So if you're going to do a portrait, you're usually going to do that vertically. Mm -hmm. And the typical portrait is like, you know, uh, chest to, to head shot, right? Or head shots and uh, use the chest. So when we turn our camera vertically, that center focus point may be falling in the center of someone's chest area. Okay? Because that's now the center of the photo. Mm -hmm. So using that single focus point, if I want to, if, if uh, our listeners can imagine that we're holding the camera vertically for, I mean uh, horizontally, the focus point's in the middle, we move it to the right side of the viewfinder. Uh -huh. Then when you turn the camera vertically, that, top, that right focus point is now at the top of the vertical shot and is going to land on the eye. 
Because we want to focus on the eyes. We want to focus on the <laughs> face. That's what we want. Okay. Yeah. And lastly is uh, depth of field uh, focus control. Okay. When I used to shoot my son's travel basketball, I was able to stand under the hoops on the court. Uh, I was using a Canon three, uh, D, D300S, which is a crop sensor, 12 megapixels. And I had tried using a 51.8 lens, okay. and I was shooting at f2. And I got a pretty decent result, but it wasn't really what I liked. And because I'm in a dark gym with unusual lighting, uh, you know, I'm shooting sports. These kids are running at me at high. And there's no flash. Oh, at no all. flash. Can't flash these kids when they're doing a layup. They'll right. go blind and crash into the walls <laughs> and things like that. So I found that for me, I bought a 51.4, but I still closed the aperture down to f2. Okay. What did that do for me? Because it was a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens, the glass is larger and it, cap it allows a lot more light transmission. Okay. And instead of shooting at 1.4, where I have almost no depth of field, I was shooting at f2 so I could get both the players, the offensive uh, uh, gentleman mm -hmm. doing the layup, and the defender. And they would both be in focus because now you have two bodies, you know, so now you need a little larger area in focus. And that was the sweet spot that I found to be successful at indoor basketball. Okay, now I'm going to rephrase that because that is such a good, <clears throat> good lesson that you just gave. Because I learned that from Joe, because you know Joe. He, Joe Fitzpatrick knows everything. <laughs> anyway, I didn't understand. Okay, so I have, I told you, I've got, everybody knows my favorite lens, f2.8, uh, 24 to 70, right? I use that all the time. I've been using it. I do weddings, I do events all this time. So... Everybody was raving about the 24 to 105, which is an F4 lens. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I'll use it for this event I'm doing. I had so much trouble focusing in the dark. And Joe said, that's when I learned, Joe told me that, I said, but I don't shoot at F2.8 ever, like ever, because I'm always taking two or three people at the same time. Of course, I'm going to be at F5.6 probably. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, even at F4, I couldn't focus as well with that lens in the dark. And he said, well, if you have an F2.8 lens, that's letting all that light, light in. Light transmission. Even though you're at F4. That's correct. I didn't know that. That was that, a really good that lesson That maximum for me. aperture determines how much light is passing through the lens, even before you take a photograph. So when you're in a low light condition and you're shooting with a, uh, an F4 or 5.6 maximum aperture lens, it's letting in three or four uh, stops of exposure less than a 2.8 or a 1.4 lens. So there's not enough light for the camera to see that contrast and determine where to focus. Yeah, if see, you darken everything even more, the camera sees less, it has more difficulty focusing, and it will take longer. It will start hunting and trying to figure out exactly where... Exactly what was going on. Exactly. I was getting it's so looking frustrated. And looking and says, where's the subject? You know, it's like squinting your eyes to see. But with a, a maximum aperture lens, it lets in more light. The autofocus system in the camera can see better. It can determine its point of focus faster and can respond faster for the photographer. That's a great lesson. High five. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you for being a guest on the Understand Photography Show. Have me back again. We have I will, more things I will. we can talk about. I know. We All have right. more. We'll have Isaac back soon. Remember to check out the show notes on understandphotography.com. So everything we talked about is going to be on our website in a few days. Um, and while you're there, look around. We've got a lot of good articles. And remember, our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. Hopefully, we see you here on, on the face, Understand Photography Facebook group, Facebook page, excuse me, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday for next week's show. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching episode number 77 of the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.